And I want to read, if you pull that out, we can read together Genesis. Because this, this really helps us. We're going all the way back to Genesis. <clears throat> now, who was the first to rebel against God? Because that's really what sin is. The devil. Okay? And if you think about it, and that's why I think the article Revenge of Conscience is so relevant, is that the devil thinks he can beat God who created him. Now, if that isn't spiritual insanity, I don't know what it is. I mean, what insanity is. I mean, just think of that. <laughs> I mean, that's just... Talk about delusions of grandeur. But that's what the devil is all about. All right. So, Adam and Eve. The man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. Now, this is what I call... And I, I'm not going to get into a whole lot about the theology of the body, but it's relevant in terms of much of the sin in our culture today. And I'll get to that later. But is um, that this is the Yahoo factor, where Adam says, and, and if you go look at their different kinds of love, this is what we call eros. Now, eros is not bad if it's in the context and with working with Agape love and filial love, if that's all working together, then it's okay. But eros by itself is bad. All right? But this is what I would call, you know, you can just imagine Adam say, yippee, because what was he with before? Animals and trees and, you know. So he's excited. And this is important. The man and his wife <coughs> were both naked, yet they felt no shame. Now, isn't it interesting, <coughs> in our creation story, that here we are, we focus on the sexual nature of Adam and Eve. They were naked and felt no shame. And, and partly what you can interpret that is, they were vulnerable to each other, but they trusted each other, so they didn't worry about it. They could be open with each other. They could be honest with each other. All right. Now, the serpent, representing the devil, was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, and what is, she, what is the devil doing here in terms of sowing seeds of doubt, temptation? Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Are you sure you heard that right? Are you sure God really told you that? How many of your kids ever did that? Oh, you didn't really say that. I didn't hear you, you know, etc. I mean, this is like children. The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. Well, it was a partial truth. And this is where the enemy works, is the enemy tells a partial truth and a partial lie, and of course that means it's a lie. <laughs> Anytime a part of whatever you're saying is a lie, then it's all a lie in reality. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's. This is appealing to ego. And that's what most of sin is all about. Who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasing the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she ate, she gave some to her husband, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. Wow. They realized, remember, the wife and his, 
The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. And we come back to this in terms of they've disobeyed God, which may, means doing it their way, not God's way. And they realized they were naked. Uh-oh, I don't really trust my wife. Because she's disobeyed God, I've disobeyed God, so how can we be trusted? Especially trusted to look out for the interest of the other. So we go on and then God's calling out and, where are you? And Adam answered, he answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Afraid of God because he had been disobedient and knew it. Who told you that you were naked? And what does Adam do? You know, Adam could have repaired it right then and there. But what does Adam do? She did it. And of course, who is Adam ultimately blaming? He's blaming God because who gave him that woman? Things are not so yippee ki now. All right. And then who, who does she blame? The serpent. The blame game. Rather than saying, oops, I did wrong. Please forgive me. Who knows what would have happened then? Of course, God knew what was going to happen, but <clears throat> all right. And then it goes on in terms of what are the consequences of that. That there are consequences of sin. And basically, what we have here is Adam and Eve taking control of their lives. We're going to do it our way, not God's way. That's what this is really all about. So if we do it God's way, we're not sinning. If we do it our way, there's a good chance we are. <laughs> all right? And we see that their relationship is broken. That's why they have to leave the garden. Because they broke the relationship with God. He didn't do it. They did it. And a part of mercy is justice, too. It's ba mercy is balanced by justice. And this is the consequences of their sin. And part of this is mystery. I mean, you know, people say, well, why did God allow them to sin? Well, th in order to love somebody, you have to be able to choose to love. If you can't choose, if you're a robot, then you're not really loving. You know, if you programmed a robot to always say, I love you, I love you, that's not love. I don't think any of us would believe that's love. It's the same with us as human beings. We have to freely choose to give ourselves to someone to love someone. So what happens real quick? Things go downhill really fast, right? Cain and Abel come along, and then what happened? God says to Cain, because he knows what he's thinking. Why are you so resentful and crestfallen? And part of this has, you know, like in the New Testament, Jesus repeatedly says, what do you care if I'm generous to somebody? Remember the parable of the talents. You know, what do you care? Why, why should you worry about that? The, the gospel's not about even Stephen. Because if it was even Stephen, we'd probably all be in trouble. It's about mercy and God's mercy. If you do well, God's warning him, you can't hold up your head. But if not, sin is a demon lurking at the door. So he kills and, you know, and so what have we been doing? So and what I like to say in terms of Adam and Eve is some people think what, what happens to Eve? What's her consequence? She suffers what? In childbirth, right? So who got the worst end of the deal? Man, what does he suffer for? Serving the soil that he came from. Now what were most of the conflicts in terms of this is the, it's looking at the consequence of sin for the next several thousand years is that man toils 
And man also dies for the soil to toil in. <laughs> because what's happened throughout history is wars fighting to maintain that piece of property and land. So you decide who got the worst end of the deal. <laughs> All right. John, you belong to your father the devil. He is a liar and the father of lies. And that's what you see going all the way back. And it's been going, happening ever since. Lies, lies. Now we lie to ourselves all the time. The devil will whisper, that's the power of the devil. And we, you know, as Catholics, we believe in the devil. But his power is not this, you know, this dramatic physical thing. It's the lie. It's the whispering the doubt in people's ears. That's where the devil's power really comes from. That's why we have to be knowledgeable and well-formed and plugged into groups, community, not church. Because if we're off by our own, Jesus, even when he sent people out, what did he do? He sent them out two by two. He didn't send them out alone. Because if you go out alone, you're going to get picked off. All right, so we see the fall, and then later on, you have the story in the Bible in terms of Noah, the cleansing of the earth. You know, the earth is so bad that God allows. Now, we also believe God does not do evil. Death, violence, destruction are evil, and God can't do evil. So even though they, the Old Testament, sometimes you'll hear, see the authors say, well, God did this or that. Well, God doesn't do evil. God is love. But that's their understanding of things. They're, you know, they're writing how they understand and perceive. They see God as a love, but also it, it, they have this picture of God almost as a schizophrenic. Oh, he's love, but then he's also very vengeful. And that's partly because in their fallen nature, what do they see around them? Violence, destruction, people killing each other. You can't trust people, etc. So then the flood occurs and then God promises, you know, he saves Noah because they're righteous and he promises he won't use the flood waters again to destroy the earth. And, then, and he gives us the Decalogue, right? The law. That's why we talk about, and Paul talks about this over and over again in terms of sin, is the law which God gave us in the Decalogue. And what are the commandments? There are ten commandments. So what are they? What do the first three ten commandments focus on? Our exactly. Our relationship with God. And what is due God? Putting Him first. And what's the fourth? It's the, the others... There's the first four, you know, or, well, you, you got some thou shalts. But you look at the Ten Commandments and they tend to be thou shalt not, right? For the most part. Although the four says, honor your mother and father. It's a positive command. So mostly it's about thou shalt not. And the rest of them, you know, the first three are God and the rest deal with what? Neighbor, right? So, if you violate those commands, and then you see all these laws that the Jews develop, some of them have practical significance, um, but they aren't really part of the Decalogue, which was the essence of the law in terms of sin. So then we have, okay, Adam and Eve basically say to God, we can do it on our own. And over the next thousands of years, what does man show? Us. They can't. Over and over again. We disobey God. We substitute other gods for God. We, you know, we sin, we disobey, we turn away from God over and over again. So it shows us we can't. That's part of what history is all about. Why God let us, why did it go on that long? Only God knows. Because we're pretty hard-headed people, you know, human beings are, in terms of learning the lesson. 
And so, you know, during all this time, there's this anticipation, right, of the Messiah coming. But their anticipation is that the Messiah that's coming is going to be this kingly royal person, like other kings. Now, if you, if you go back and, you know, we've talked a little bit about this in terms of Scripture, you had the judges, which is the way God wanted his people to be ruled, but they looked around and said, oh, well, look at this country. They got kings that are on thrones and royal and, and you know, this one, and well, why can't we be like them? So God gave them kings, and that didn't turn out so well either. Although, there, you know, David was a good king, and Solomon was, but there was a lot of bummer kings, you know. So, we see Adam and Eve want to do it on their own. We can't do it on our own. But what does every other religion, when it comes to growing in the faith or whatever it is, what do they do? How do you become a better Buddhist? How do you become a better Hindu? You do it. You earn it. And what do we say as Christians? You can't earn it. You can't. It's a gift. That's, you know, if nothing else, in terms of one of the unique aspects of any faith. You go and look at every faith. That's why Christianity is so unique, besides the fact of Jesus, but just in terms of that, that teaching. You can't earn it. It's not about earning it. Because we've shown we can't. And so this is where partly original sin comes in, right? Because of Adam and Eve. That we are steeped in a culture that's full of sin. We can't escape it. The only reason Mary escaped it is because of a singular grace given to her by the very God that she would bear. Again, mystery. God is not limited by time and space. We tend to think linearly. God is not limited that way. God is everywhere at all times. All right? So Jesus' death upon the cross and the grace that came from that was available to Mary even before he was born as a human being. So sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is a failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by perverse attachment to certain goods. And when we say goods, that doesn't just necessarily mean material things. It could be ideas. There's a lot of things that can encompass. It wounds the nature of man and injures human solidarity. It has been defined as an utterance, a deed, a or a desire contrary to the eternal law, the law of God. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. That's what we do in terms against God. Sin sets itself against God's love for us and turns our hearts away from it. Like the first sin, and this is from the Catechism, it is disobedience, a revolt against God through the will to become like God's. The ultimate in egot egotism. And we all have that desire. We want power over people. We want to control our lives. We want to control other people for us, for our benefit. That's our original sin. That's our nature that we have to fight against. Knowing and determining good and evil. Sin is thus love of oneself, even to contempt of God. So J Jesus comes along, right? To take care of this original sin. To give us the grace to overcome original sin and to be able to at least not do mortal sin. The probability is you know, we're all going to do venial sin. Even the saints are not sinless. It's just that they were so holy that we know they're in heaven. 
It doesn't mean they didn't have sin. Augustine was one of the worst um, before he converted. But Jesus comes along, and what does he give us in terms of dealing with sin? He, his law is what? Two, the two great commands, what are they? Yeah, love God. Love your neighbor, what? As yourself. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. So that must mean you've got to love yourself. Hmm? Love your neighbor as I have loved you. Yes. You see it both ways. But it's always what comes first. God's love. We have to love God in order to, and of course God's love of us starts the process where we can accept God's love and love others. And we can only love ourselves if God's love is operating in us to love us the way God wants us to be loved. Not the way we want, necessarily, but the way God wants us to love ourselves. So God has to come first in all that. Otherwise, we, you know, love can get carried away where we're egotistical and then we can't love our neighbor. So there's that tension. You know, in, I'm, I don't know if I've said this before in terms of tensions. Have I mentioned that? That, you know, people talk about balance. I prefer to use the term tensions. Throughout Scripture, there are these tensions. And the reason I say that is because it takes work on our parts, to maintain the right balance. It doesn't just happen. You don't just arrive at a point, oh, okay, things are settled, you know, I got everything in the right balance. No, it's a constant work, because the devil's constantly tempting us, original sin's try constantly getting in there, so we have to work at maintaining that love of self to where we can love others appropriately. Right, but part of the reason we have to love our love ourselves is because we are in the image and likeness of God. We are also creatures, and and of so we have to take care of ourselves and love ourselves in the right kind of way. Now, in our culture, what do we got? It's the, what do we, we got the me generation, right? Or us in magazines, we got us, we, me. You know, it's all about self. And that certainly is not Christian. That is not what the gospel is all about. The gospel is about giving. That was the problem in terms of Adam and Eve, is they were concerned about giving to each other. They weren't worried about taking from the other person. Because the minute you start taking, because that's what sin is, too, is it's taking. It's all about get, taking from others for me. And even taking what's properly due to God for me. That's why I is in the middle of sin. Yes, that's right. <laughs> now, what's the word in Latin? Or, you know, what's the word in Greek? Or <laughs> That doesn't always work, but anyway... <laughs> But, th but that is true, yeah, I, ego. But what's in that is Jesus, it's not about thou shalt. He actually gives us grace, and then he sets a much higher bar. Because what does he say to do to your enemies? Love your enemies. Pray for them. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he sets a higher bar. If you what? In your hearts. If you lust. It's not just that you go and fornicate with another woman. It's even if you're really thinking about it. If you're watching pornography. I mean, I can't think of a clear scripture where it says, even if you're lusting in your hearts, even if you're not doing anything, per se, it's bad. And the reason is it may not be a mortal sin, but it certainly can lead to a mortal sin. And we'll talk about the differences of sin. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Those encompass God's law. The law of love. Not the law of death. Which is what Paul talks about, the commandments. Because there's no way you can live up to the law, the Decalogue really, without God's grace. And therefore, it was the law of death. Because nobody could really live up to it. But now we can with God's grace. And remember the neighbor, the Samaritan. Who is your neighbor? You can't get, you know, your enemy is your neighbor. Remember the Samaritans, some of you, you know, know history-wise, is the Samaritans were heretical Jews. I mean, they were like outcasts. A faithful Jew had nothing to do with them. So who does Jesus pick as his example? The Samaritan, in terms of dealing with the, the guy who's beaten and robbed on the side of the road, right? Because Jesus wasn't a respecter of a group, per se. Yes, he said, I came to preach to the Jews, but the message was for everybody. And he shows it because he gave it to the Samaritans. He uses them throughout Scripture. He used the soldier, etc. So we have... I, what I would urge you to do in terms of the new law that God has given us is to go and read Matthew 4 through 7. Chapters 4 through 7. You got the Sermon on the Mount. You have parables. I mean, you just got all, all these stories. Jesus really lays it out in terms of examples. We can't read through all that tonight. But. I would encourage you to go and read that in terms of, if you really want to get a, a, an idea of the new law of love. So, we've been captured by original sin. Jesus came to undo that. Now, there was a heresy, and to some degree, the reason I bring this up, not to give a big historical lesson, but there's some of this exists amongst Christians today. The idea of earning it. And there is the Pelagian heresy, which was in the 400s. And he basically said, you know, that we weren't contaminated by original sin, etc. And the consequences thereof. But now you could see in terms of the fact that we are contaminated by original sin, why we as Catholics believe in baptism of infants. Because even though they're not <coughs> committing sin per se... They're still affected by it. And as they're growing, they're growing in a sinful environment. And we believe in baptism that that can help protect them. Completely, no. But it does help. So that as they're growing and learning, they're impacted less by the sin around them. Then there's semi pelagianism uh, that because this is declared heresy, so, so, so then a group came along and they tried to put a little more twist on it and say, well, God, people can reach out to God under their own power. What do we believe? No. We believe the only reason you can say yes to God and accept God's love is because His love is already in us. In every human being. Because you're created, in, every human being is created in the image and likeness of God. But we can squash that image down over time, and become like a Hitler. Because you sure, it's hard to see much image of God in, in somebody like Hitler or Stalin or, you know, Khmer Rouge. And some of these, uh, you know, killers who kill lots of people. But until you die, there's always the possibility that somebody can be reached. And you hear stories about that, people who are just horrible people who get, you know, have turn around. God's mercy is always out there. But we can't do it under our own power. It's God working in us that enables us to say yes to the grace. It's grace that helps us to say yes to the grace. And so, what that does for us, it helps us know that we can't do it on our own. We have to always turn to God. 
And to some degree, that should make us feel comfortable. Well, you know, so all I have to do is turn to God. I don't have to do it on my own. Now, we, let's talk about objective and subjective sin. What are objective sins? Well, the Ten Commandments. You know, if somebody violates the Ten Commandments, then we could say that's an objective sin. And the, an objective sin. Now, the reason I say subjective is because somebody may, God may tell you, the Holy Spirit may tell you not to drink alcohol. He didn't tell me not to drink alcohol. But he may have told you not to drink it. Therefore, if you go drink it, what are you doing? You're sinning. That's the, the subjective aspect of sin. That God knows what each of us, our needs are. And he has unique expectations for each of us. Now that wouldn't be called a mortal sin. That would be called a venial sin. But venial sins, the problem with venial sins, is they can lead to mortal sins. Because you can dispose your heart where you're constantly doing venial sins, and then, oops, you take that ultimate step. And we'll define mortal sin. Now, and one of the things that we're talking about, now some of these terms are very theological, <coughs> but it's important to understand, like imputability, because... <coughs> Why we look at, you know, somebody could be an alcoholic and it may not be a sin. For somebody it may be. Because somebody truly, I mean, we know there are genetic characteristics. There are certain things that people can inherit. Or somebody could have been abused. You know, and I talked about psychology. Well, that is a factor. I mean, we know people who've been physically abused are more likely to abuse somebody else. Because they're damaged. It's hard for them to, to let God's grace operate in them. And that's why you have to be careful about judging. Objective sins, if somebody violates the Ten Commandment, we can say, that's wrong, that's a sin. Oh, you can't judge. No, you can judge. There are certain things you can't judge. What you can never judge is somebody's salvation. That's what you can never judge. And you have to... And, and imputability may be, you know, somebody kills. Well, what do we have? We have different degrees, right, of murder. Because there's multiple factors that can go into that in terms of killing somebody. That some are more serious than others. So, you know, that's why the church talks about mortal sin and venial sin. I mean, we do that in law. Why wouldn't God look at that in terms of, okay, somebody, you know, we talked about this when 9-11 occurred. Could those guys who flew those planes, could they end up in heaven? You know, and, and for some people it was hard to wrap their minds around that. Yeah, it's possible. Although these guys were pretty well educated for the most part. Then I'm not sure that God's going to sit there and say, well, yeah, you were ignorant, you know. No. <laughs> so, but only God knows that. Were they raised in a situation where they really were brainwashed? They thought they were going to their own heaven. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to get into that. But, <laughs> but um, so there is objective sin and there is subjective sin. And so subjective sin is, you know, if that little voice say, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Then we have to be open to that and sensitive to that. We have to teach ourselves. That's where prayer and the sacraments, etc., comes in to help us so that we don't get on a road to something more serious. You know, you go and look at people who've done some horrendous things. More often than not, you know, they didn't just pick to do that. Oh, I'm going to go do this today. You know, it's a bad thing. Over their life, they kept choosing Bad things, making bad choices. And you sear your conscience. You, then you can no longer hear the voice. Or you drown it out. Now you'll hear, as part of this in terms of responsibility, is you hear people say, oh, well I have to follow my conscience. 
You know, you, I'm sure you've read about this controversy in terms of these politicians coming for communion who's supporting abortion. And they're saying, well, I got elected, da 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 Well, are you a Catholic who happens to be a legislature or a legislator who has a little Catholicism, quote? Well, there's, there's no, no such thing. I mean, if you're Catholic, you're Catholic, and that informs what you do. Now, you have to be careful with that. There, there's prudence and getting spiritual advice in terms of what you vote for and support as a public official, but you're still a Catholic. And when you sit there and publicly say, I'm, I'm supporting pro-choice, then you're not really being Catholic. You say you're following your conscience, but the church's teaching on that is crystal clear. It's not muddy at all. There's no wiggle room whatsoever. Some things there is. Capital punishment. There's wiggle room. But there's not on abortion. And so if you're supporting laws to kill babies, you've committed serious sin. So the church is saying, well, hey, why, why are you saying you're Catholic? Because people are saying, you know, well, I, you know, my conscience is clear because I, I don't believe this in terms of um, that it's right but I have to support it because other people should have that choice. Well, then why don't we just, you know, vote for everybody to kill whoever they want? I mean, that's crazy to say that. We put restrictions on what people could do. Why not that? Now, it's a little more complicated. I know that. As a doctor, I could, you know, in terms of what do you do, how do you punish people, especially women who are, in a lot of times, very serious distress. I don't want to minimize that. I've seen those people. I've counseled them, you know. So I know they're going through a lot. But the guys who are doing it, usually are doing it for money. I don't have any sympathy for them. Okay. Other than I do have to pray for them. They are, in a sense, an enemy we have to pray for. That they would get a conversion of heart. Because if you're in mortal sin, where is that going to lead? Eternal condemnation. You know, and the babies, in a sense, we don't know exactly what's going to happen to them, but they haven't sinned. They're not in danger of um, being condemned to hell, but the people who are doing abortions are. And that's why we have to pray for them. So that's why we shouldn't hate them. Okay. Sometimes I understand, you know, you, if you've had somebody killed in your family, it's very hard not to do that. I mean, I, you know, the whole child abuse thing, you know, if somebody were to abuse my kids, I mean, my first reaction as a father, I'll be honest, I mean, I want to go kill them. That would be my first reaction. Now, I have to pray that God will give me the grace not to do that. <laughs> but that's an understandable reaction as a man. Okay, but conscience is not something that we put up against the church. And that's what people are doing all the time. They're saying, I mean, just think about that in terms of arrogance, to say, 2,000 years of teaching, debated most of these things, thought about, talked about, wrote about, and me as an individual, I know better. You don't think that's a little prideful? But the tension here is, the church would say, you must follow your conscience. <laughs> because if you didn't, you'd be violating yourself. You wouldn't really be loving yourself. If your conscience is saying, this is the right thing to do, you have to do it. But the trouble is that people don't make the effort to inform their conscience. They don't really study the church's teaching. They don't really get wise counsel. They don't really pray about it. They've shut the door. They've said, no, I'm not going to go with that teaching. And that becomes the sin. Your conscience may say, oh, I'm clear doing this. But if you haven't done everything you can in your power, and you must always presume the church is right. 
That's the starting point that the church knows better than you do. Because if you're approaching it with humility, that you have to start from that point of view. And then you, it's up to you to find good reasons not to go along with the church's teaching. I'm going to say Francis would be a good example of that, right? because you know, to people that are, you know, are coming to the church, they don't understand the church is always right. They can look at St. Francis, you want to tell the Well, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to say the church is always right, because the church has done bad things, but when it comes to dogma, the church is right, yes. And the church has authority when it comes to faith and morals. But St. Francis is what, you know, he did is he was getting criticized and he was not in good relationships with his bishop. And so he went to Rome and said, hey, Peter, you know, I feel like God has called me to do this. And th you see this, you know, this is some of the struggle in the early church. It's some of the struggle today, people say, oh, the Holy Spirit's calling me to do this. Well, how does that fit with the traditions of the church and everything? And St. Francis went to Peter and the Rome and he said, whatever you tell me, I will do. He submitted himself. And you find that usually when that happens, I mean, you have these great and wonderful things happen. You know, in terms of people who, if the Spirit's leading them, the Spirit is not going to lead you in rebellion to the church, you know, against the church. What Luther did was rebellion. What Luther did was no different from what Adam and Eve did. Now, if he would have stayed in the church and fought the things that were wrong at the time, who knows where we'd be? But he chose to rebel. And our duty is, in, is to try to help reform the church from within in love and humility when there's things going wrong. The Pope said no, and he went away in humility. Right. And then the Pope had a dream. Right. The, the Holy Spirit will work through that. That's where you have to, to submit that eventually the Holy Spirit is going to get it across to the people in the hierarchy. Sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> I mean, we have to be honest about that. Sometimes it takes a while for that to happen. You have to be patient in the Holy Spirit's timing. Um, okay, so for a sin to be mortal, because uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. A grave matter, if you violate the Ten Commandments. But for it to be mortal, you have to have full knowledge and complete consent. So in, in essence, I mean, you have to know that what you're doing is a grave matter. I mean, if you're ignorant... Um, then it's not, even though objectively we may say it's a mortal sin, but if you're truly ignorant, it may not be for you. That's where that subjectivity comes in. Objectively, it's wrong. But you have to know. You, in other words, you have to freely choose. In your spirit and in your will, you basically have to say, I know this is wrong, God, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's basically what a mortal sin is. You can add, what about if a politician um, votes for uh, same-sex marriages? That we should... Uh, it could be a grave matter. It could be. Because marriage is a sacrament. And it's an attack on the very nature of marriage. The sacrament of marriage. Um, so a, a Catholic, you know, in good conscience couldn't support that in terms of marriage. Now, we could get into debate about, which I, I would not do this and say that they should do this, but if you could, a, could the society say that um, same-sex couples, they're not married, could have certain kinds of benefits. That would be a totally different issue. Now, I would not be in favor of that, but it wouldn't be the same as saying that that's marriage. You see what I'm saying? Um, I don't think it would be a good thing, obviously. <laughs> um, let's see. 
There is a thing in there about fundamental option, which um, I'll give you some information on that. I'm going to send you um, later because that this is something that's come up before in terms of people can be, quote, fundamentally oriented towards Christ and eternal salvation, and then if they do something, you know, one's bad sin, that they're not going to lose their salvation. Eh, wrong. You can't. You could be sitting there and living a life like you, you're trying to grow closer to the Lord and then choose to do something. Now, it, it's hard to picture that if people are truly choosing that. But for all intents and purposes, it may look like people are doing that and then commit a mortal sin. Boom, out of the blue. Well, there's probably something going on inside uh, with that. Um, and so in terms of a mortal sin... Is it you have to look at the object chosen? And what what is the action? What are you trying to do? And then the intention. Why? In other words, somebody something you can do may look good. You know what Jesus talked about that, right? People looking, oh, I'm fasting, look at me. You know, or wearing the prayer things on their head. I forget what they, phylacteries and, you know, things that are obvious show. But what he said is their intention was self-oriented. It wasn't oriented towards God. It was oriented towards, hey, look at me. So intention's important. And then the circumstances. So that, you know, if somebody puts a gun to my head and says, if you don't shoot so-and-so, uh, or puts a gun to my wife's head and said, if you don't shoot so-and-so, I'm going to shoot your wife, um, it would probably not be a mortal sin for me to shoot that person. The mortal sin would be who? The guy who threatened me. So, you know you started getting into heroics. How, how, how much must people endure or, you know, in terms of you know, only God can sort all that out. But circumstances are important in terms of what you're under duress. Somebody goes and steals because their family's starving. That's different than somebody who steals to go buy, buy a 40-inch screen TV, you know. So the intentions and the circumstances are factors still wrong, but part of the reason if somebody's starving is, guess whose sin that is? That could be all our sin. Because if they're trying to work and trying to get a job and doing what they can, and we're not helping them out, then that's partly our responsibility too. This is where you can get into, and I don't want to get into the whole thing about, you can have social sin, etc. You can have structures in place. There's a lot of those right now in our government and some and more coming where you can put in place structures that are sinful by their very nature. Now only individuals can commit sin, but the structures promote sin in our culture. They can institutionalize it. So, that's a lot, I know. That's why I go read Matthew. Um, you know, read the, through those catechism. That's why I gave you a bunch of material to read. Because to try to cover sin, you, you know. I mean, if you go to the catechism, there's just pages and pages of stuff to read in terms of sin and mortal sin and conscience and etc. And conscience is important because your intention, you know, and do, do you know whether it's right or wrong? You know, what is your motivation? So... People can sin mentally and not like physically engaging in activities. Like if you're a, a Catholic and you support abortion and support gay marriage, but you don't actively take part of that, that's still oh, yeah. that's sinning. It could be, yes. It could, it could be in terms of venial sin. And, and the trouble again with those actions. It's like, the, the, uh, give you an example in terms of watching a pornographic movie. In and of itself, would that necessarily be a big sin? 
may or may not be. But the point, what, is it, what does it say about sexuality? What does it say about women in terms of your attitude towards women, etc.? So it may be a reflection of some serious problems inside in terms of attitudes towards other human beings. And that's why it's so heinous. You know, it's so bad. I mean, you look at it and there's studies coming out more and more in terms of men. That is what you are saying when you get involved. And it's not all men, but it's mostly men. The trouble is the number of women who are getting involved in it, it's growing. And, you know, what it, let's get back to Adam and Eve. What do we talk about? Nakedness in terms of sexual sin. How much of the sin that's going on in our society today? is related to sexual sin. A huge portion of it. I was just going to clarify. I'm not sure. Did he answer your question right? I got a little different idea from what you asked. Go ahead. Uh, chair. Chair. Like, uh, what, if you're, what if you're standing on the beach and you see somebody drowning and you know, stand there and watch and you take no action? Sin or not? So sometimes yeah, a, a physical action is not required for sin. Right. Uh, sometimes standing and doing nothing can, can lead to... Well, yeah, I, but, but I think there that points out, though, that, that sin by... I mean, you can sin by inaction. Yes. Omission. Yeah, that would be a, a sin by omission. Because if you could save somebody and help somebody without any risk to yourself, then you have a duty to do that. Love your neighbor. I mean, that's not loving your neighbor. But now if it puts you at risk, then you're not obligated to do that. But of course then Jesus would say, well, you know, what's the greater love is the person who's willing to die for somebody else to save them. That's complicated. And that's why you, you gotta. That's why you gotta be praying and be with the Holy Spirit to have the guidance in what terms of what to do. Because you know, you know, you got. I got a wife and uh, seven kids. You know, do I do something to put myself at risk? And then, how does that harm them if if I were to die? Uh, you know, not easy answers. That's why the principles and the basic ideas <coughs> are not that complicated. Life is complicated. What you do in certain. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, th and that's why it's good to repent, you know, because, you know, why do you, you know, and we'll cover this in penance, but why do we go to the priest, and why not just go to God? Because what are the two great commandments? God and neighbor. When you sin, even if they don't know about it, you're affecting your relationship with your fellow human beings. It's a spiritual principle. You know, there are principles that it's like gravity. You may not believe in the spiritual principle, but it's still in operation, whether you believe it or not. If you don't believe in gravity and jump off a building, I promise you, <laughs> you will experience the result. It may be only for a flash, and then all will be gone. But uh, there are spiritual principles, and that's, one, that's why we go to the priest. It's because you've offended God and you've offended your relationship with the body of Christ, who the priest represents both. The one thing that, uh, that you know, as we're talking, um, that keeps coming back to mind is the, the issue of accountability and how you understand uh, your own accountability both to God and to humankind. And that is, uh, and that's a very personal, personal thing because it involves your relationship with God. But, for example, both the object, the intention, the circumstance, all of those deal with that issue of accountability. Yep. That's why the Catholic faith about the encouraged to make an act of petition every night before you have an examination of conscience helps that you don't have to like pile up sin upon sin and all of a sudden you're like, why? What happened? Why am I? Right. And, and you know, as John, John uh, 
says, 1 John, is that, I, um, you know, if you say you've not sinned, you're a liar. We sin every day. And that's part of the tension, too, in terms of we, we do venial sins every day. As we grow in holiness towards sainthood, we do that less and less. Well, I'm saying grow. If, you, <laughs> if you're not doing it less and less, then you're not really growing. You know, and, and the truth is, in terms of sin, is we may have an area that, you know, like I tend to have an anger problem. I still need to grow in that area. Even at 60-something, you know. Men tend to have that problem. But, you know, it's, it's by our nature, you know. But that doesn't oh, excuse it, you know. So we have to, are we getting better? You know, and it can be drinking, it can be other things, you know. You know, alcohol, just as an example. Is it a sin to drink alcohol? No. It's, you know, obviously if you drink and drive, that's a sin because you're sinning against your neighbor. You're putting them at risk, right? Besides violating the law, which is render under Caesar. That would be a sin, really. We as Catholics believe it's a sin to violate a just law of the land. All right? But alcohol, I think, you know, to me, the, the guide in terms of if you're sinning is if you're acting really strange and you're not your normal self and people notice, then probably you drank too much. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of us in this room have done that on occasion. So, but the point is, as Ellen says, is an examination of conscience every night before you go to bed to think back. Who did I hurt today? Did I offend? Who, what persons did I hurt? Was I rude to? Da, 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 da. In the traffic line, etc. And who did I hurt in terms of God? And that's a way to get a handle on sin in our lives, is every night to think back through the day. Because it's there. And if, if you can't come with, up with any, then you're deceived. <laughs> so any other questions? I know we still have some time if you want to. We still have a few questions. It's been a long evening. Um, I'll leave it up to you all, whether you want to stay and go through your questions or whether you want to go home. <laughs> and we won't be back until, I think, what was it, January 7th or something like that. Yeah. Can I add a comment? Um, the part of the catechism that I like why we exist to know, love, and serve God. Mm -hmm. That part, the first part is to know. And the church always teaches that we need to use our reason to develop our conscience. So we have to seek right. the truth right. and learn it. And it gets to the point of whether you know it or not, being accountable for it. Um, but if you don't ever look for it, you know, or come to know, it's hard. In today's environment, there's so many different messages out there that it gets so confusing, especially for young people, because everybody's saying they're right and this relativism is out there. Right. But to me, that's one of the greatest things about being Catholic, is we have this, this, uh, this um, marker in the ground for 2,000 years Amen. That, is, that we can compare to. And it's visible to all. And right. as you come across something that doesn't make sense, like stem cell research or whatever, you can look to the church and say, well, what does the church say about this? Right. And Ignorance is not an excuse. Right. In this day and age, and when you listen when you listen to these politicians who say they're Catholic, listen carefully. And as what I would challenge you is when they make their statements, go exactly to the catechism and see what the catechism says. Because this is willful, willful ignorance. And that does not uh, give you immunity in terms of your conscience. When it's willful ignorance. And we should be willing to know. Exactly. And the more we know and understand, the more we'll love God. Right. And the more we'll want to serve Him. And the more we'll want to know, and it's a circle. So, it is a confusing world. I mean... All the time. But, re come up but remember what I said in terms of, in the homily, in terms of the grace is far greater than the power of the sin.
The power of the grace is far greater. So we can be optimistic. If we turn to the grace, we can overcome it. Now, it may not happen tomorrow. It may take years in, for some of these areas. But that's okay. Because if you're acting in faith, you go to confession, you look at it, you repent, you know, at night, etc. Given time, you will succeed. You may fall down 70 times 70. <laughs> but you can pick yourself up and turn to God. And God's always willing to take you back. You know, if you're sincere. Biggest emphasis is on faith. Have faith in that grace that it will carry you. Absolutely, absolutely. You can't do it yourself. You just can't do it yourself. Is a lie truly a sin? Oh God, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> it it can be. It, de it it's definitely a sin if it's meant to hurt somebody. That is definitely a sin. There, theologians debate this, so I, you know it's not worth getting into. But but you know. It's like, uh, you know what slander is? And read some of those scriptures that I gave you there. I mean, Paul, put, you know, I mean, he portrays people who do these things. I mean, you're going to hell. I mean, these are bad things. And slander is to lie about somebody's character and something they've done. <coughs> now, gossip is to talk about people's business. And that can be a sin, especially if it's malicious gossip, if it's meant to hurt somebody. Gossip in and of itself may or may not be sin, you know? I mean, if you've got a big family, you're going to talk about your family, you know? That's normal. But at the same time, what's your intent? What are you trying to achieve? You know, so malicious gossip, that would be a sin in my book. Slander is always a sin. I mean, the Bible's crystal clear on that. So, you know, I mean, there's some things that Paul is like, mm, 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 and Jesus says too. So, um, those are guides. But, if you're having a struggle in an area, with God's grace, you can overcome it. See, there's always hope. And I'm serious when I was saying about, I've had people come in and say, oh, God can't forgive me for what I've done. That's an enemy, of, a lie from the enemy. We don't know. We don't know. He obviously knew he'd done something wrong, but... Well, we don't know. We don't really know. We don't have enough information to, to say. Did he despair? Because despair... And you know what that is? That's a negative pride. Because what you're saying is your sin is greater than God's love and God's mercy. And... You know, so I've had to, I mean, I've counseled, I had to work with people to get them out of that. That's really hard when people say that, you know, because they've, they've been pro programmed in them, themselves to think that way for so long. And it can be really hard to turn that around. You know, there's many women who've been healed who've committed abortions. You know, because God can forgive that if you're really repentant. And they see. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's, you know, pretty bad stuff, you know, when you do that. Um, in terms of your soul, what you're doing to your soul. Um, but God can forgive and heal that. Doesn't always come. Sometimes you suffer with the scars till the day you die. Yeah, but would he do it? Yeah. They were young again. They're going through the same thing. And then would they do it? No, no. But God will forgive if you ask for his forgiveness. He wants to forgive your sin. <laughs>